So ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to introduce Lenore Kishik. Ani. Bonjour. Bonjour. Lenore Indijnikas. Mein gan in Dodam. Nia shingming in Donjaba. Minwa saking nia shing in Donjaba. I have introduced myself to you in my language, Anishinaabe Moin. I've told you my name, Lenore. I've told you my clan, Mayan Gun. The wolf in Dodam is my clan. I told you where I come from. I said, Nia Shingaming in Donjaba. Nia Shingaming um, means that beautiful point of land that almost looks like an island, but is only partially surrounded by water. <laughs> In Donjaba means where my sound comes from. So my sound, my breath, my perspective, whatever it is that makes me comes from that place. Ninwa and Saking Niashing, aka Bruce Peninsula, is also where my sound comes from. Because you see, the Bruce Peninsula is part, as is uh, Gray County, uh, part of the traditional homeland of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Uh, this is an alliance of two First Nations, Chippewas of Nawash, unceded First Nation, located at Niashingaming, or Cape Croker on the map, uh, located uh, on the Georgian Bay side of the peninsula, and our sister nation, Saugeen First Nation, located uh, next to Southampton on the Lake Huron side of the peninsula. Now, the peninsula became part of the province of Canada in 1854. This is not a treaty that uh, either community wanted to enter into, and hence land claims. But I'm not here to talk about land claims. I'm here to talk about trees. I'm going to start off with um, two really short narratives from a man named James Nawash. Uh, he's a, uh, an Ojibwe man. Nishnabe Nene, from Perry Island. The first short one, and I'm and I'm actually pre-saying I'm making these a little smaller than otherwise they'd be really really long. The first one. Shawana Gijik travels around the world, and then returns to the south and calls all the beings to him, and they come. And one by one, he transforms them into birds. He transforms them into birds or into animals. The second part of the narrative has to do with 12 men. 12 men walking towards the sunset. There are 12 of them. And they travel for a while until they realize that two of their companions are missing. So they turn around and they, they go back, they retrace their steps, and they find their companions. Their companions were taken to the earth so that trees and plants can grow. The remaining 10 men reach their destination in the west and are changed into trees. Maple, red birch, 
white birch, black birch, beech, pine, spruce, oak, and two others. In my experience as a storyteller, I would say that these two short narratives, the transformation of beings into small birds and animals, and uh, the 12 men walking towards the setting sun, are stories about climate change. Now, after the transformation, after the uh, animals and uh, the birds and the animals, there was another transformation. Things, uh, the temperature, the climate became very, very hot so that the large animals were turned into small animals and large trees into shrubs. So we have these three... Uh, Three little pieces from James Nawash. And as I was saying, these are, I believe, probably the oldest stories that we have about trees. What I would like to suggest about the men traveling west is, uh, first of all, they didn't run through the Bering Strait. <laughs> no, they were traveling west. In fact, a lot of our stories talk about uh, traveling uh, west to east and east to west. There was no north and south. When I, when I came across these stories, I was, I was studying geology. I wanted to know a little bit more about geology. And it occurred to me then, as I looked at these stories with, um, with new eyes or a, a different vision, it occurred to me that, and especially when I looked at the transformation, well, maybe I should just back up first. Shawana Gizik translates into summer sky. So summer sky is as the story said, is traveling all over the world, but let's just think of that as North America. The transformation of the beings into uh, birds and animals, when I, when I looked at the list, were in a particular order. There were the, there were the omnivores, those birds and critters who will eat anything. And if you're coming into a barren landscape, you've got to be able to eat anything. What followed then were the carnivores, and then uh, the herbivores, those critters that, uh, that uh, rely on plants. And then there were the granivores, those uh, critters that will eat seeds. So if we look at that progression, to me, that was an indication of um, reclaiming a barren landscape, a landscape left barren by the melting glacier. The 12 men changing into trees is still part of that narrative. And it actually, when, when, when I was talking to uh, my professors about, about these trees. And uh, he said, oh, that is pollen zone two. What is pollen zone two? <laughs> well, pollen zone two uh, actually indicates warmer weather. So from, let, let's go back, we'll say pollen zone one has to do with spruce and uh, balsam. They need colder temperatures. 
Uh, they also need to have their feed wet, so the ground is a little bit uh, is a little bit wet where they grow. Whereas the plants from pollen zone two need warmer temperatures, and uh, they need uh, the ground to be a little bit drier. So I thought, okay, that that fits. That that works. That works for me. Now. Let's just leave the geology behind. And I have a couple more uh, traditional stories. There's a story about a prolonged night time. And that's because the sun got caught in a tall tree. Imagine that. The sun got caught in a tall, tall tree. And so night went on and on. And that was OK for those, uh, those critters or those creatures, those people who uh, like to get up and do things uh, when the sun is not around. And as for those daytime creatures, of which I'm one, <laughs> uh, you know, they got to sleep in a bit more. And so it was fine until the novelty wore off. Those nighttime creatures, they didn't want to hunt anymore, or we could say they didn't want to party anymore. Those daytime creatures, well, they were getting hungry, and they wanted to get up and, and, and do things, but they needed light. Well, it was, the, it was a little brown squirrel who said, I know where the sun is. The sun is caught in a tall tree. The other animals scorn her. But no, she, she knows she's right. And so she goes off to find the sun. And yes, she finds the sun caught in a tall tree. And she sets about to free the sun. And for all her hard efforts, she suffered mightily and became the first bat. Another story tells of how Nanabush, let me explain Nanabush to you. He is our culture hero. He is our trickster. He is our teacher. And you might wonder wh why or how it is that we have a teacher who is a fool. Well, I can explain that. You see, he's like, he's like each and every one of us. We make mistakes. Sometimes we get things right. Yes. And so we learn. We learn from this great teacher. We learn from his mistakes, his transgressions. We learn not to do those things. And we learn from the good things that he has done. We learn to emulate those things, to be like him, to do things in a good way. Well, Nana Bush got caught in a, um, I was going to say tall tree, but it was actually, this is how the story goes. His brother died. His brother was lured by these giant serpents to go under the ice. And Nanabush searched everywhere for his brother. And finally, after weeks or months of searching, he finds these evil serpents. And they're basking in the sun. So he tricked them. And he was able then to get into their den, which was down under the ice. And he saw there the corpse of his brother. And so he killed these serpents. 
And the serpents caused this great flood. Nanabush, he went running out of that den. He was running as fast as he could, trying to get to the high ground, because the water level kept rising and rising and rising. And what saved him was that he climbed into the tallest pine tree. It was a white pine. He climbed to the very top, and the water kept rising higher and higher and higher. In fact, the water got all the way up to his chin. And he thought maybe that was the end. But then very quickly, the water level started to go down. And it receded. The cool thing about that story is that um, it fits in with the geologic history of the Great Lakes. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Here are three very short traditional songs. I'm not singing them. Um, I'll recite them as I recite poetry. They're very, very short. Uh, they would have been repeated four times. I will not do the repetition. The first one, now listen carefully. The bush is sitting under a tree and singing. The second song, towards calm and shady places, I am walking on the earth. And this traditional song is called the Song of the Trees. The wind only I am afraid of. In the introduction, um, you were told that I'm an outdoor educator. I take people out on guided hikes. I help them to understand their relationship with the land. Um, I have a particular hike that I do called the Medicine Walk. And uh, in this walk, in this walk, I help people to understand our four sacred trees. Cedar, maple, birch, and ash. I would like to share with you some of the information, some of the knowledge about these sacred trees. Um, some of them I have here. The only one that is missing is maple, and I apologize for that. I could not find my maple sugar candy. <laughs> but I think there's some maple sap out there somewhere. Okay, first of all, cedar. Cedar is a small tree that reaches heights of about 15 meters or 50 feet. Uh, it's favorite browse for deer. And I know that when I eat venison, I can taste the cedar. The cedar leaves, uh, they're opposite leaves. They're flat, scale-like, and they have a wonderful aroma. I have some over here. And you're most welcome to have some of that. Take it home with you. Uh, it has small oblong cones that, uh, when they mature, they look like these teeny tiny little brown roses. 
cedar in our language, Kishik, very much like my name, Kishik, is referred to as an ornament on the great teacher's head. And if you know a cedar, and you know its beauty, yes, it's very fitting to be an ornament on the great teacher's head. I have here two very old cedars. I'm going to show you the, young, the youngest one first. Uh, that is this one here. Not round, as you figure most trees would be. But it does have continuous growth. I'll show you. Now, in order to count the rings, the life rings of this tree, you would have to have a steady hand and a magnifier because the life rings are so close together, so tight. How old do you think this tree is? Yes? That's pretty close, yes. It's actually uh, about 1,400 years old. Now, do you have any idea of where it would have come from? The cliffs, that's right. So this is one of the ancient cedars uh, found on the cliffs of the Niagara Escarpment. Uh, it was through the research of uh, Doug Larson, a professor from the University of uh, Guelph. Pretty cool. I would like you to show you a very old piece of cedar. I like to refer to this piece of cedar as a grandmother. This cedar was found 59 feet under the water, near an island called Lucas Island, so that straight between uh, the peninsula and Manitoulin Island. There are a series of islands, uh, leading, smaller islands leading up to Manitoulin Island. One of those islands is called Lucas Island. This is a root from an eastern white cedar. It has been radiocarbon dated at approximately 8,700 years old. This particular cedar has, I, I've, is, in my, is in my keeping, and I keep it for the Soggy and Ojibwe Nations. Uh, this cedar ha I have taken to ceremonies, and it has the blessing from our lodge. And people then, uh, once they were able to understand about this grandmother, uh, and realized that at one time, water levels in Georgian Bay, Lake Huron, Michigan, Lake Michigan, were very, very low. One of the reasons uh, we refer to these trees as sacred trees is because we use them. We use them for utilitarian purposes. We use them for medicinal purposes, for food, in ceremony. 
and we have stories for these. For cedar, there is so much of the cedar we can use. We can use the bark, uh, we can use the roots, we can use the wood, we can use the leaves. So everything we can use. With the roots, we could make things like this here. This is used for binding things together. This is roots. Uh, this one, the lighter one, has been processed. It is flat on one side, rounded on the other side. Uh, the bark has been taken off. And right now, it's very brittle. But if I were to put this into water uh, and, and let it soak, it would become very pliable. I could then use it for holding things together, like the pieces of a birch bark canoe. Because you see, the flat end then will go over the corners or the edges. And when it dries, it will dry tight. <laughs> the bark. I don't have any samples here, but the bark can be used. Uh, the bark is very fibrous, so we can take it off and we can uh, twirl it into a yarn, and then uh, it can be woven into bags, or it could be woven into mats. Our people were particularly fond of uh, weaving, um, weaving uh, cedar bark into what we call medicine pouches, uh, bags in which we could carry our talismans, our special things, and our medicines. It was also really good for uh, keeping wild rice safe and good. The wood. The wood is aromatic. It's very strong. It's lightweight. It holds fire. So being a material that is lightweight or a wood that is lightweight, uh, cedar was an important part in the birch bark canoe. It made up the gunnels, the seats, uh, the ribs. That's important, uh, particularly when you want portability. The only thing is don't let it get wet because then it gets really heavy. The wood is nice, has a beautiful grain to it, makes nice furniture, very rustic, uh, wonderful furniture. The leaves are something else. Leaves could be used as ground cover. Say you could then put your bed roll over the, over the cedar boughs. Smells nice when you go to sleep. But there are other ways that we've used cedar boughs. We've used cedar boughs as a medicine. We make cedar tea, particularly in the winter time. We, uh, we, put, the we put the cedar boughs into water bring it to a boil until the water is just a very light yellow, and then we sip that. It's a good source of vitamin C. It's an expectorant, too, so it'll loosen up any kind of congestion you have in your chest or in your throat or in your head. The thing is, you don't want too much of it, because if you take too much, then that congestion could turn into a very hard, dry cough which to me is worse than any kind of congestion. There's another way in which cedar boughs are used. Uh, and that's a, as a disinfectant. The cedar boughs are boiled in a big pot of water until, until it becomes what we call cedar water. It has a nice 
reddish brown color. And we take that and uh, we disinfect. In ceremonies, we take the cedar water and we bathe people who are returning from fasting. And then, of course, there are just the cedar boughs, just the plain cedar boughs. It used to be that cedar boughs were put on the floor uh, of, uh, of council chambers. Well, they weren't chambers, they were lodges <laughs> way back then. And that's because cedar exudes positive energy. I have one one elder teacher who referred to cedar as a cleanser. Uh, this was some time ago because <laughs> immediately I thought of Ajax or I thought of Comet. But cleanser, it, the way she meant it was that it takes away negative energy. It promotes uh, positive thinking. And so when cedar boughs are spread out on the floor of a, a council lodge, or even put out on the tables uh, for meetings and things like that, it gets rid of the negative energy. Because when people gather together in council, the idea is that they are taking care of the community, of the nation, and they need to do so with positive thoughts and good energy. I have one lowly little example here of birch. Now, if I could have brought my birch bark canoe, I would have done that. <laughs> There are two main kinds of birch. There's the white birch or the paper birch. Uh, there's also the yellow birch. Wigwas, and I can't remember the name of the other one. And I think you understand why birch is a sacred tree. It's because of the bark. The bark was used for birch bark canoes. It was also used uh, as coverings for our lodges and for containers. Containers for food storage, uh, for carrying and collecting, uh, let's say, maple sap or water, uh, and even for cooking. Birch also has, has its medicinal purposes. Can be used in a number of, uh, a number of ways. Um, the inner bark uh, can be used for the treatment of blood diseases. Uh, the root bark can be used for intestinal um, ailments. The bark powder is good for diaper rash, and skin rashes. My father used to like to um, use the uh, twigs from the yellow birch to make a cough medicine. He would make this for the, for the elders in our community. Uh, this cough medicine was... Um, used only for those hard, dry coughs. And I think you know, well, maybe you don't know, but um, birch trees can also be tapped, like maple. Uh, that's usually done uh, after the uh, maple sap run then it'll be time to 
um, tap birch trees. Uh, birch sap could be mixed with uh, maple sap for a nice uh, refreshing beverage, or it could be uh, taken on its own. Um, you never boil, uh, you never boil uh, birch because then it will become very bitter. But you can take the twigs and you can infuse them. You can pour hot water, it's like making tea over the twigs. And you get a nice uh, refreshing beverage that has a bit of a winter green taste. There's a story, in fact, there are a couple of stories about birch, how it got the, um, the marks on it. I don't know if you can see here. Maybe I'll just hold up. Uh, you can see the, uh, the lines here. This piece is not big enough, but uh, there are uh, other marks on birch that look like little birds or thunderbirds. And uh, these uh, marks came about uh, because of uh, Nana Bush. He got himself into trouble because he went and he stole some feathers from baby thunderbirds. And he, he roughed them up a bit. And uh, when he made his escape back to Earth, the uh, the parent thunderbirds came by and they were shooting their arrows at him. They were just trying to, to, to claw him, to, to, to grab him. You know, they wanted revenge. And he ran. And he ran. And he got really tired. He had no place to hide until he found this uh, birch stump. And he crawled inside. And the Thunderbirds would not touch that. They will not touch birch, because birch is referred to as a child of the Thunderbirds. So he was lucky, Nana Bush, to hide in that birch. And because of that, it is said that he blessed the birch so that it would always have the marks of the claws from the, from the Thunderbird. And then the larger marks uh, look very much like little Thunderbirds. And it is also said of Birch that lightning will not strike Birch. Maple. Maple is one of the four sacred medicines, and I think you know why. Mm. <laughs> Maple is the only thing that satisfies me, as the, as the, as the song goes. So maple, it's a hardwood. It burns hard makes a nice fire, a uh, nice hot fire when you're ready, when you're ready to cook. Um, it's strong, so it's good for making uh, tool handles or kitchen utensils, you know, stir things or those big wonderful wooden bowls. Very nice. Now, there's a cool thing, there's this really cool story about maple. Did you know that there was a time, and I suspect uh, the climate was much warmer, but there was a time when, when the nice brown sap used to drip out of the tree. Yes, nice sweet sap would drip out of the tree. And when the people found this out, well, heck, they would just go out to the they would just go out to the maple grove. They'd break off a branch, and then they'd stand, <laughs> and the syrup would just drip, drip, drip into their mouths. Pretty soon, everyone in the village was out in the maple bush, standing under the trees, sitting under the trees 
lying under the trees, all with their mouths open. And that wonderful sweetness was just dripping in. Well, Nana Bush came along for a visit. And he, 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 he saw all these people out under the maple branches. And he wondered, what's going on here? So he watched. And then he went to the village. And he saw there in the village people who needed to be taken care of. There were the children. There were the elders. No one was looking after them. And he thought to himself, I need to talk to my grandmother. He spent a lot of time talking with his grandmother. So the two of them talked, and they agreed, yes, people needed to have sweetness in their lives, but maybe it shouldn't be so easy to come by. Maybe people should work for that sweetness. And so they caused it to rain. And it rained, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained. And that nice, sweet sap, when it dripped from the trees, was no longer brown and dark. It was watery. And it had just a hint of sweetness in it. Nana Bush then set about to show the people how they needed to work, how they had to gather the firewood, how they had to make containers out of birch bark, how they had to tap the trees and collect the sap and keep it from going sour, and then how they had to heat up the stones and put those stones into the uh, sap containers and do that again and again until they had that nice, sweet, sweet, sweet maple sugar. So we have cedar, we have birch, we have maple. And over here, We have ash. And I truly hope that you've taken time to look at those baskets out in the lobby there, because they're made out of ash. There are at least three different kinds of ash that we can make baskets from. Black ash, green ash, red ash. Oh, there's another ash too, but we don't make baskets out of that. That's white ash. This lacrosse stick, the handle is made out of white ash. Ash, all of the ash, are even gray, are even grained hardwood. They make excellent fire. Cool thing about ash when it burns, it burns quiet. It doesn't crackle. I burn ash at home. I don't know if any of you have uh, wood stoves, you burn ash. And I know that I have to get up and come over and see if it's uh, still burning because it's so quiet. This, uh, this is a harvest basket uh, made out of black ash. Uh, this is me being really impatient in basket making. <laughs> I'm even less, in, well, actually. <laughs> Believe it or not, <laughs> it takes as much time to make one of these as it does uh, one of these. I thought I was being smart. I could make something really small. It wouldn't take so long. It wouldn't be so hard. But holy moly, I learned my lesson. <laughs> but I also brought some guests with me here. 
Uh, these little uh, white critters Uh, and right here, these incredibly beautiful metallic green insects. <laughs> Everything has its beauty. It's unfortunate, but this is a real threat to our ash. It's a real threat to our ash. Now, about five, six years ago, uh, one of my friends, a forester, um, told me that the forests in uh, southern Ontario were about 40% ash. Hmm. Not anymore. So ash, it's good for baskets. It also has medicinal purposes. Uh, the inner bark of green ash apparently tastes like eggs. I think I would like to try that sometime. What I would like to do now um, looking at the clock here, looking at my watch, I would like to share with you um, my songs for the trees. Uh, it's not singing because I'm not a singer. Uh, these are poems uh, from my book, Running on the March Wind. Ninatik stood alone in the middle of a fresh brown field. I approached, stood under its lime green branches, breathing in the beauty of its star-shaped blossoms and small new leaves. I love this tree. I raised my arms, took hold of the maple-strong branches, and lifted myself to dance and sway in the wind. I love this tree. I love this tree. I love trees. I love this tree. I love trees. I love this tree. I love trees. I love. Dance variation. In a field near my grandma's house, I dance again. I dance with a mulberry tree above and around its crown. Arching, stretching, we unfold to the rhythm of the wind. My tree and I, we dance, and the clouds love to watch us dance. Under the branches, I curtsy. And I hold out my hand. You have been watching. You pull down a branch to let one small leaf pirouette in the palm of my hand. Autumn blush. Cheek caresses bark amid Oak red and russet. Lone passerby looks up. His smile burns my cheeks. Trying to fly. You used to dream about trying, trying to fly. Fly off somewhere or return home from somewhere. And you'd not be able to make it, because you could not get
get your feet beyond the treetops. The branches held on to you, impeding journey after journey and all your efforts for a quick way home. You would will yourself up into the sky, into the sky. You would leap towards the clouds. You would run and then jump. You would leap from boulder, from fence post, from building, from tall building. But alas, always you found yourself tangled in the branches. At other times, you simply had no energy, not even the slightest bit of momentum to rise into the beyond. The years moved on steadily, and you grew up, grew older and wiser. But in dreams, you remained hopelessly, hopelessly caught in the trees. One day, after taking stock, after turning a number of other things around in your life, turning things around to look at in a new way, a new light, you thought to yourself, maybe I'm doing this all wrong. Maybe this is not what it appears to be. That's when you discovered the trees. The trees. The trees. They were playing with you. They were keeping your head out of the clouds, your feet off the ground. They were holding you up, lifting you up to heaven. A great day. Empty, naked white park, mine drifts over trails, wandering now old under fresh snow. A great day. What a great day for hunting rabbits. Wind sweeps rooftops clear of fresh fallen snow. Wind feathers snow, curling snow down and out over the city. Snow winds up tight between buildings, then fans out to cool the flushed face faces of pre-rush hour traffic. Snow poised in white lines leaps before the wind and blusters out over the big city. What a great day to hunt rabbits. The cedar bush would feel so good now. Smell so good now. Sound so good. Ever wonder? Ever wonder about the life of trees in Withrow Park? their height, their scent, their strength, their girth, and the band of bleached bark over their roots. Ever see those strong branches, how they reach out for sunlight, hold on to the sky? Each to its dying grasp gives us our life's breath and holds on to the sky so that heaven will not slip away again, and we will not again forget that we too are part of the same creation. South America is killing rainforest. British Columbia is killing rainforest. Northern Ontario is killing white pines. In Mississauga, a man bulldozed 48 acres of trees. His land, his land for developing. Everywhere people kill trees. But here in Toronto, we're saved from that kind of mass destruction. The acid rain, acid fog, acid snow ain't all that bad. And heck, 
We only let our dogs piss on the trees. Ever wonder how much dog piss it takes to kill a tree? Elm. Arching green, dancing green, stretching green, sweeping green, bowing green and gold to the earth over the seasons, in fields, along roadsides, and beside the houses we grew up in. And then they stood, gray and broken against the sky, against the blue, against our memories. Children into the future will never see the elms. We'll never see the elms arching, dancing green, stretching green, sweeping the sky, or elms bowing green to the green earth. Our children will never see the trees, the trees we have seen. They will never know the trees we have known. Cedar, translucent green shimmer, cedar whispering to the wind, cedar sipping the salient sunshine, savoring sun's promises of another hot summer, cedar's sweet breath, cedar's cool touch, touches my face, my shoulders, my tired body, and I am again refreshed. I remember now, cedar, a blessing, a gift, a power, a strength. I had almost forgotten. I'd like to close with the final poem, Song for the Trees. I sing to the trees. I dance with the trees in dreams, in dreams. In dreams I sing, in dreams I dance. Northwest I face, northwest. Leaves spread before me. Northwest I dance, northwest. Leaves wave before me. In dreams I dance, in dreams I sing to the trees. I sing to the trees in dreams, in dreams. I dance with the trees in dreams, in dreams. In dreams, in dreams, in dreams I sing, in dreams I dance, in dreams, in dreams. A A A A A A A Thank you very much.